What you're looking at here is issue number one of International Comics, published by EC Comics in the spring of 1950. Back then, in order to save money on second-class postage permits, it was common for publishers to change the title of a series rather than cancel it and start a new one. This particular series was published bi-monthly and had its title changed four times. The first change came with issue number six when the series became International Crime Patrol. Then, in the very next issue, it was scaled back to simply Crime Patrol. They overextended themselves, I guess. You gotta stay local. Can't have any French people in our crime comics. We won't have it. Won't have it, I tell ya! The comic began to change when the Crypt Keeper first appeared in Crime Patrol number 15. He would quickly become the horror host, introducing the reader to blood-curdling tales of fear, fright, and terror. With issue number 17, the book was renamed after the Crypt Keeper with the title The Crypt of Terror. And finally, in issue number 20, the comic series took on a name that would eventually become iconic. <laughs> The, the original comic series lasted just five years until 1955 and published just 46 issues, only 27 of which were actually called Tales from the Crypt. Although it should be noted that the series was revived in 2007 for 13 issues when publisher Paper Cuts acquired the license. Another revival happened in 2016 when they relaunched the comic with more of a focus on the adult market. It was cancelled after just two issues with a third left unfinished. Why it was cancelled seems to be unclear. So join me, my fancy morbid monsters, as we explore the Crypt Keeper's vault in this nauseating narcotic known as Tales from the Crypt, a terrifying tale of censorship. Max Gaines was a former editor for All American Publications and one of the original pioneers of the comic book format. In 1944, All American was merged with DC Comics and as a result, Max retained the rights to a comic series titled Picture Stories from the Bible. So Max formed Educational Comics with the intent to market comics about science, history, and the Bible to schools and churches. Ironically, it was this same company that would become the industry leader in crime and horror comics, the publisher of Mad Magazine, and the bane of many a teacher and a preacher over the coming years. You see, sadly in 1947, Max Gaines passed away after a boating accident and his son William Gaines took over the company. Under the guidance of good old Bill, EC began a new line of comic titles in genres like horror, suspense, and crime. It printed these titles under the name Entertaining Comics, a far cry from the original vision Max Gaines had for his company. In addition to Tales from the Crypt, EC Comics had two more horror anthology series for a total of three, along with two suspense anthologies. Aside from Tales from the Crypt with the Crypt Keeper, they also published The Haunt of Fear and The Vault of Horror, hosted by The Old Witch and The Vault Keeper, respectively. To be frank, these titles were clones of one another. Each one had its own host, but also featured stories from the other two as well. Typically, each issue contained two stories from the horror host it was named for, followed by one more story from each of the two remaining hosts for a total of four. A friendly rivalry between these hosts was often played up to lighten the mood, along with a frightening number of puns and spooky dad jokes. Not that I would know anything about dad jokes. A skeleton walks into a bar and says to the bartender, give me a beer and a mop. In 1954, EC attempted to add a fourth book to its horror lineup, reusing the title The Crypt of Terror. It was to be hosted by the Crypt Keeper himself and was announced in issue number 46 of Tales from the Crypt as part of the introduction to the story Upon Reflection. He promised readers that they would be sickened by his latest collection of cadaverous cavortings. Unfortunately, as fate would have it, the Crypt Keeper's cadaverous cavortings couldn't cope with the cultural clash of comics and congressional committees and condemned by the coming comics code, the Crypt Keeper and his tales from the crypt were cancelled. Who wrote this cantankerous crap? Not only did this new book never see the light of day, but issue number 46 of Tales from the Crypt would be the series last. Soon, EC Comics horror anthology books would be as dead as the ghosts and vampires that appeared within their pages. 
It's not like EC Comics didn't see this backlash coming. Adding another horror comic while under attack for printing horror comics may seem a bit tone deaf, but EC had no intention of going quietly into that good night. They were going to fight to keep their publications going, and they did, right up to the gruesome end. In fact, just one issue earlier in Tales from the Crypt number 45, and also in the Vault of Terror number 40, they ran this editorial. In it, EC Comics took a hard line against the hysteria over children reading comics and without naming names, they called out fear-mongering psychiatrist Frederick Wortham, other publishers, and irresponsible parents. The article read in part, Comics are under fire, horror and crime comics in particular. Due to the efforts of various do-gooders and do-gooder groups, a large segment of the public is being led to believe that certain comic magazines cause juvenile delinquency, warp the minds of America's youth, and affect the development of the personalities of those who read them. Among these do-gooders are a psychiatrist psychiatrist who has made a lucrative career out of attacking comic magazines, certain publishing companies who do not publish comics and would benefit by their demise, many groups of adults who would like to blame their lack of ability as responsible parents on comic magazines instead of themselves, and various assorted headline hunters. These people are militants. <laughs> EC Comics called upon its readers to write letters of support to the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, even going so far as to ask small children to have their parents write on their behalf. However, the real writing was on the wall, and by October of 1954, EC's entire horror lineup was cancelled. The editors printed one last letter in the haunt of fear number 28. In it, they announced the cancellations, explaining that the retailers and wholesalers were no longer willing to buy or sell horror comics. Then, in the fourth paragraph of that same article, came this brilliant, sarcastic gem of a quote, destined to go down in comics history. I'm not even kidding. Quote, Naturally, with comic magazine censorship now a fact, we at EC look forward to an immediate drop in the criminal and juvenile delinquency rate of the United States. We trust there will be fewer robberies, fewer murders, and fewer rapes. It's beautiful. It's f***ing beautiful. But by 1956, EC had cancelled all of its comic lines, concentrating on Mad Magazine, the publication that would become its biggest claim to fame. The truth is that the controversy that surrounded comic books had been around since the 1930s. Many educators saw them as a bad influence on children, fearing that comics hurt students' ability to read and promoted poor taste in literature. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. Professional journals were awash with articles on how to wean children off of superhero tales and onto something more tasteful. Churches and other civic groups were unhappy with the content of comic books as well. They believed that the scantily clad women often depicted in popular comics were shameful and immoral. They further argued that comics promoted and glorified crime. Most unorthodox! Later on, as post-war America turned its attention inward, juvenile delinquency became a major focus for media institutions and lawmakers. For the first time, mental health professionals joined the outcry, including Dr. Frederick Wortham, a psychiatrist from New York. He claimed that children imitated the actions of comic characters and that reading comics desensitized children to violence. While Wortham is often depicted as a fraud or failed social scientist who lacked any credibility, that's not completely fair. Well, it's a little bit fair. Wortham's opinions on comics and juvenile delinquency, along with his categorization of homosexuality as some kind of deviant activity, may seem outrageous by today's standards, but at the time, these beliefs were sadly pretty common. Still, Wortham is often demonized, misquoted, and taken out of context. This is in part because he often used hyperbolic language to generate public interest and sell books. In reality, he didn't even think comics were the biggest problem facing children, just one factor in a larger issue. His actual stance on the matter, as stated in his testimony before Congress, wasn't all that unreasonable. Crime and horror comics shouldn't be sold to children without permission from their parents. I simply sympathize with that argument. The idea of someone selling my son a copy of the latest issue of The Walking Dead does not sit well with me. Not to mention that the vast majority of media from games to movies and music are all rated according to age here in the far-off future.
future of whatever year this is. My point is that Wortham was not a fan of censorship, and in fact, he had nothing to do with the harsh rules imposed by the Comics Code Authority. The comic book industry literally brought that upon themselves. Now, I'm not saying that Wortham was right. Personally, I doubt very much that comics or other forms of entertainment are even a minor factor in juvenile delinquency. But I don't want my son reading The Walking Dead because he'll have trouble sleeping that night. Not because I think he'll remodel his life after Negan and start shaking me down for protection money. In fact, when Wortham's research became available to the public in 2010, assistant professor Carol Tilly studied it and found his conclusions to be baseless. In her article titled, Seducing the Innocent, Frederick Wortham and the Falsifications that Helped Condemn Comics, Tilly wrote, Wortham manipulated, overstated, compromised, and fabricated evidence, especially that evidence he attributed to personal clinical research with young people for rhetorical gain. Her opinion on overly long titles and confusing sentence structure remains unknown. To be fair, Wortham has also had some positive effects on the world as well. He provided treatment for poor black patients at a time when mental health services for African Americans were uncommon due to racism within the field of psychiatry, often based on so-called scientific racism. Then later, Wortham's institutional stressor findings were cited by several courts when they overturned segregation laws, eventually becoming a factor in the decision Brown v. Board of Education. In 1959, Wortham pitched a follow-up book about the evils of television to be titled The War on Children. No publishers were interested. He passed away at the age of 86 on November 18, 1981, in his Pennsylvania retirement home. The Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, led by Tennessee politician Easts Kivar? Kifaber? Estes Kifaber? Estes Kifaber, issued a final report and surprisingly found that comics were not responsible for crime. How about that? However, the committee did recommend that the industry tone down the violence, a statement some publishers took as a thinly veiled threat of censorship. The industry had tried to self-regulate once before in the late 1940s, forming the Association of Comic Magazine Publishers, or the ACMP. This organization had a publisher's code and a seal of approval, but the code was ignored by small and large publishers alike. The seal was printed without any approval process, and some companies flat out refused to join. So Slick Willie Gaines called a meeting between publishers and suggested that the comic industry fight outside censorship and repair the reputation of comics together. They formed the Comics Magazine Association of America and its Comics Code Authority. Ironically, the horror and crime comics Gaines that EC Comics was known for would be forbidden under the CCA. Said Gaines, I tried to convince them that we should form an association and hire anybody we could find who could do some sort of independent, honest research into whether comic books, in truth, were the horrendous things that people said they were. And since I really didn't think they were, I figured such a study would exonerate us. None of these guys wanted to do that, and right away the whole thing was taken away from me, and they turned it into a situation where they wrote a code, and the code forbade the use of the words horror, terror, and crime. And this was all of my books. so it would wipe me out. Unfortunately for Gaines and EC Comics in the aftermath of the Senate hearings, no distributor would handle comics without the CCA seal. And as Scott Nicewonder pointed out recently, the CCA forbids horror comics outright, and then still goes on to write three more rules on the subject. And that was that. After initially refusing, EC gave up, cancelled its horror comics, and started a handful of CCA-approved titles. They performed very poorly, and EC switched its focus to Mad Magazine. The rest, as they say, is history. In June of 1989, premium cable network HBO started a new horror anthology show based on the classic EC comic series. It ran for 93 episodes over seven seasons and pulled many stories from the three original EC horror books. Because HBO was a subscription-based service, it was one of the few anthology series free from network censorship, except when it reruns on other channels. You know, this whole thing reminds me of the Senate hearings on violent video games spearheaded by Joe Lieberman in the 1990s. Both stories involve the government threatening censorship through legislation and regulation, 
publishers turning on each other, so-called experts giving testimony about a connection that doesn't exist, tons of fear-mongering, and both ended with self-regulation. The main difference seems to be that when the gaming industry formed the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, or ESRB, they banded together and refused to allow the ESRB to censor or dictate content. The Comics Magazine Association of America, on the other hand, was all about dictating and censoring content. In the 1990s, through a remarkably similar process, we ended up with a system simply meant to decide who the content is appropriate for, and market as such. Four decades earlier, we ended up with a yes or no morality test that all content had to pass. I guess we can learn from our mistakes.